and have the signs of this journey. So he says, I'll sign Arabic and I'll translate because it's kind of, I think it's pretty incredible to be able to speak it in the language the person actually wrote it. He wrote it in the year 1453. And he actually lived in a very important place for copy, um, a city in Yemen called Mogra. And it's the reason why we're all here today. He says, O copy of story of love. You helped me repel away my sleep. And you helped me with God's help to stay awake and worship my Lord while people fell asleep. Don't blame me for my intense love for coffee. It is the drink of the righteous people. And that it is, right? Um, so for me, when I, when I first read that, I was really taken back. I didn't know coffee was looked at as like a spiritual drink. But these, these people in Yemen believed that God had brought down this incredible plant to help us reach higher states of consciousness and intellect. Uh, so coffee begins to be consumed in Yemen and cultivated there. The word coffee is actually an Arabic word, kahwa, which is in type of wine. Uh, the, the wine that raises you to a state of ecstasy. I think the Arabic language is pretty incredible. It's really descriptive. Even the words like love, there's not one type of love. There's wadda, wash, haram, habda. Each type has a different meaning for it. And so coffee, the other word, I uh, mean, is something that satiates you or makes you not hungry. Uh, and so what they would do is they would gather together at these long these, uh, gatherings like tonight, after long hours of work, and they would drink this beverage and talk about God and uh, get to know each other. Or any more cycles. Um, <laughs> and then they would talk about themselves and build a really powerful sense of community. And then Kali eventually makes its way out of Yemen. There's a few stories of how that happens. One by an Indian saint named Baba Budan. So Baba Budan, he was willing to risk his life for Kali. Because at that time, it was illegal to sell seeds in corners. Uh, he did the execution was dead. So Yemen had a monopoly. For 200 years, Port of Mogha was the place to hide. It was the only place in the world where you could get coffee. Uh, and the word coffee of Tahwa becomes Kahta. The Turkish people who lived in Yemen worked in the they, uh, they control the Port of Mogha. They have a hard time pronouncing the Arabic letter wow. So Kahwa becomes Kahta. K A H V E. Then the Dutch in 16. 16 began doing, began doing work in Yemen, and they took coffee, and they spelled it K-O-F-F-I-E, coffee. And then 1582, they entered the English language as coffee, C-O-F-F-E-E, or coffee if you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, shout out to Bed And so I, uh, I love this part of the history because um, eventually Brother Barbara Dunn, he, he stole, he snuck seven seeds out, they say. Some say his underwear, others say he hid it in his stomach, he was kind of fat, he was kind of able to develop in his belly. He makes it to India, where coffee begins to be grown there, and there's actually still a shrine for him in the south of India. Eventually, coffee makes its way to Indonesia by the Dutch. The Dutch sends these spies out, and they steal, some say also, seven seeds. Um, and they take it to their one of the colonies in Indonesia on the island of Java. And that's where the name Java comes from. Java and Mocha, these two places that began bringing coffee to the world. Um, and so, after that, coffee finds its way to Europe. The Ottomans besiege Vienna in the year 1683. It's a very epic battle. 300,000 Ottoman troops out there. Um, it's one of the most important battles in the history of the world. Uh, the, there was a, a, a Viennese soldier named George Franz Korczynski, Polish actually. And he, was, he spoke Turkish. He had lived in Istanbul, and he was able to sneak through Turkish lines and send wards to the Polish to send in reinforcements. They bring in reinforcements, Ottomans retreat during the cold winter, and they leave behind all these things. And from them were 500 sacks of strange beans. The Austrians thought that, they were, uh, that it was camel food. But George knew what they were, and they were coffee beans. And they came from Vienna, from Mocha. 
So as a gift, the king gifted it, gifted it to him, and he took those um, he took those beans and he opened one of the first coffee houses in Central Europe called the Blue Bottle, and that's where that name comes from. It's all these names you hear for coffee. And it's always uh, people choose those names for a reason, for the historical significance. Uh, eventually, um, and then when coffee enters Europe, something really magical happens. Like I love this, the taste of coffee and smell and, and all these wonderful things, but I, I love the potential of coffee for humans, for us. Because in coffee houses, um, in cities like Vienna, London, Paris, Brisbane, um, people who more coffee, their main drink was alcohol. Something that numbed their senses. People were always pretty much wasted for a long time. And then when coffee comes into Europe, these, these coffee houses, people have something that does the opposite. It heightens the intellect, and it produces incredible human curiosity. Um, you had coffee houses that were known for writers, some for musicians, some for philosophers, some for politicians, bankers, economists, uh, and ideas really moved in these spaces. Um, and it was really incredible how that happened in that time period. Um, I remember, it, and I read it. I always say that uh, coffee finds its birthplace in Ethiopia, its soul in Yemen. But Turkey is where it really finds its art. The first coffee house in Turkey, the barista, becomes an incredible um, position where he had, or he, he or she had direct access to the Sultan. And then it becomes such an engraved part of society that in 1475, under Turkish law, a woman had the right to divorce her husband if he didn't give her her daily quota of coffee. Priorities. Um, and so I really fell in love with this time period and, and, the, and how coffee houses sprung out. Um, eventually, coffee makes its way by the French, and it's able to clue. The French were gifted a coffee plant by the Dutch after a peace treaty. And in the year 1721, able to clue uh, takes cuttings from that and crossed the Atlantic Ocean. First, they were robbed by Algerian pirates. Shout out to the Algerians here tonight. <laughs> Then they make it, their way through the Atlantic Ocean, and he begins to ration out his water and food supply to this plant he had in a glass box. Uh, eventually, coffee makes its way to, they make it to the Caribbean, uh, to the island of Martinique, from there to Haiti. That one plant, it's called a noble tree, and something like 90% of the world's current coffee production is traced back to that one plant. Uh, the Haitian people, at one point, Haiti produced half the world's coffee, and when the Haitian people fought for their self-determination against the French, the retreating the French army burned a lot of their crops. Kali eventually finds its way to Central and South America, and now Brazil produces almost a third of the coffee from this one plant of seven seeds in the region from Yemen and Ethiopia. And in, in biology, that's called genetic bottleneck. And it's one of the reasons why coffee in Yemen is very special. Um, that, that type of history about coffee. Um, I can go on and on and talk about the history of coffee. It's, it's pretty incredible, and, and I do recommend you guys to check it out. Um, there's a really cool book that talks a lot about that, called The Monk of Mocha. <laughs> <laughs> my, own sh my own shameless plug. Um, and, uh, but I won't ruin the end of the book. I won't tell you if I make it or not. Um, let me just pass out some of these for you guys. You're welcome.